Hello everyone. Welcome to session eight of LTEC 676. In this video, we're going to continue talking about theme three, racial and ethnic divides, differences, and needs. To get started, I wanted to say thank you for attending yesterday's synchronous session. We had an engaging conversation that wove together a number of the weighty topics we've been covering this semester. If you weren't able to make it, don't worry, we'll schedule another optional discussion later in the semester. In other news, I wanted to say I'm looking forward to watching your Uneven Aspects video reflections. I haven't had a chance to watch all of them yet, but I will as soon as possible. Speaking of which, I want to point you to a new resource that has been posted in the Key Documents module on Canvas. You will now find a link to a running document of discussion thread syntheses. This is the ever-growing list of syntheses put together by your classmates each week. There is a critical reflection. I just added NGLs and ELISA's insightful syntheses to this document, so be sure to check those out as well as the previous postings. Now, Critical Reflection 5 asked you to connect a lot of dots, one of which was the Class and Poverty Quiz. So let's take a minute to review the results of that quiz. As you might recall, there were 15 questions. And as you can imagine, there were a lot of different scores. The class average based on 12 respondents was 6.64 out of 15, which was about 44%. And there was a fairly large standard deviation of over 3.0. So that's a pretty big spread. Now, I've used this quiz a few times over multiple semesters of this class. So here are your results combined with students from all of the previous years. And as you can see, this chart is based on 36 responses. When calculating for all 36 responses, the average goes up slightly from 6.64 to 7.03, which is still less than 50% out of 15. The point of an exercise like this is to get us thinking about the profound differences in class and poverty levels in the United States, and in turn, get us thinking about how those differences play out when it comes to education and technology. One of the questions on the quiz was about the SAT, the standardized test which I'm sure everyone knows about as it is often used in college admissions in the United States. This particular item gets at the issue of what the SAT really measures. The item asked which of the following variables most closely predicts how high someone will score on the SAT test. And there are four choices available. One, race. Two, family income three, parents' academic achievement, and four, region of residence. This is the distribution of how everyone who has responded to this item from the past few classes has scored. Of course, the correct answer was family income, which about 47% of all students have gotten correct. I'm focusing on this item because I want to connect the SAT to our earlier conversations about technology and equity. Keep in mind that technology can be any number of things. It can be objects, processes, hardware, software, and so on. I emphasize that because the SAT itself is a form of technology, and arguably a form of educational technology. And, like other technologies, the SAT is built upon countless other technologies, including everything from written language to multiple choice tests to computer adaptive testing. Over time, the College Board has leveraged various technological innovations to administer the SAT at an enormous scale for decades. The whole phenomenon is actually quite astonishing to think about. Now, I mention all of this because I want to drill down into the SAT and the impact it might be having on racial and ethnic divides as related to educational achievement and opportunity. To do that, I want to show you some more recent SAT results. 
The information I'm going to show you is from the National Center for Fair and Open Testing, which is an organization that works to end the misuses and flaws of standardized testing and to ensure that the evaluation of students, teachers, and schools is fair, open, valid, and educationally beneficial. They went ahead and analyzed the results of the 2019 College Bound Senior Scores on the redesigned SAT. And so you could see here along the y-axis, we have categories of ethnicities, and then we have one column dedicated to reading and writing, one column dedicated to math, and then another column dedicated to the total score. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is the average for all 2019 college-bound seniors. Their average score of all test takers, and this is based on over 2 million SAT test takers, the average score was a 1059. And that actually went down nine points compared to the 2018 college-bound seniors. Now, importantly, the National Center for Fair and Open Testing argues that the SAT score gaps between demographic groups grew even larger for the high school class of 2019. More specifically, they argue that compared to 2018, students from historically disenfranchised groups fell further behind their classmates from more privileged families. And this was true whether broken down by test takers' race, parental education, or household income. In other words, just like Linda Darling-Hammond told us in 2007, the gaps in achievement are actually getting worse. So here I've highlighted the groups that have lost the most ground compared to the class of 2018. Now, here's another breakdown of average SAT scores broken down by income, race, and parents' educational levels. And this was produced by the Wall Street Journal and the College Board. What you can see here are the color codings reveal the distributions relative to the national averages. If we look at the left chart, we see the overall average is a 1068, and Asians score significantly higher than that. White score significantly higher, whereas Hispanics and Blacks are scoring significantly lower. We see a similar pattern with the middle chart based on parents' highest education level. Parents with a graduate degree or a bachelor's degree, those children score above the national average, whereas folks with associate's degrees, a high school diplomas, or no diplomas are scoring well below. And then relatedly, the rightmost chart is showing a comparison of the distribution based on household income. So clearly there are disparities in SAT scores, or if we wanted to use Sutton's language, outcomes as measured by SAT scores. So now what I want to do is show you the Harvard class of 2020. And here you can see this is simply a plot. On the vertical axis, we have SAT score. And on the Y axis, we see GPA. And obviously, we're seeing the vast majority of those dots. Each of those dots represents one admitted student for the class of 2020. We can see that SAT scores are extremely high. In fact, some of them are earning perfect scores. And then in terms of their high school GPA, we're seeing almost all of them have a high school GPA of 3.8 or higher, and many of them have a perfect 4.0 in terms of a high school GPA. Now, how does this translate into the ethnicity of the Harvard College classes? Here I've broken down the data for the classes of 2017 all the way to the classes of 2022. Taken together, this gives you an understanding of who's being admitted to arguably one of the most prestigious colleges in the world. Now I want to talk a little bit about the College Board's Adversity Index. Now, if you don't already know about it, in May 2019, the College Board added a single score measuring students' economic hardships and other disadvantages. A student's adversity score could range from 1 to 100 with an average score of 50. And higher numbers mean more disadvantage and lower numbers mean less disadvantage. The score is calculated using 15 factors, and you can see some of those factors shown on the right-hand side. It's roughly broken down into factors related to neighborhood environment, family environment, and high school environment. The new adversity score was part of a larger rating system called the Environmental Context Dashboard, and the College Board included this adversity index score 
with test results in the reports that it sends to schools. Now, interestingly, the College Board announced that students, the test takers, would not receive their adversity index score. Now, the CEO of the College Board in a press release argued that the dashboard is designed to shine a light on students who have demonstrated remarkable resourcefulness to overcome challenges and achieve more with less. It enables colleges to witness the strengths of students in a huge swath of America who would otherwise be overlooked. Now, interestingly, the College Board's adversity index was widely criticized. Critics said that the adversity index falsely suggested that a student's achievements and challenges could be quantified as if it were a math or a verbal score. And some felt that a single adversity score could not capture the most important factor of student disadvantage, the income and education level of their parents. For that reason, the College Board made three changes. The first change is they renamed it. Uh, it's no longer called the Adversity Index, it's called Landscape, and it's now going to provide separate scores on neighborhood and high school, and the scores are now going to be available to students, not just the colleges. And here's a little bit more information about College Board's landscape. The idea behind this is to provide consistent high school and neighborhood information for colleges. In theory, this new information should help admissions officers fully consider every student, no matter where they live. So I wanted to share this current event with you as we think about racial and ethnic divides, differences in needs in the context of this course. Now, I'd like to transition to a related topic, the tech industry in diversity. Now, I'm sure many of you are aware that diversity in the tech industry, it's been criticized as being pretty terrible. In fact, a 2019 article argued that for years, companies and educators in the tech sector have framed diversity as a pipeline problem. The people with the right educational background get access to the right training, which gets them into the right college, which connects them to the top employers. So we're seeing this kind of vicious cycle that self-perpetuates inequality, and some would argue is actually making inequality worse, even though technology is often billed as a means of addressing some of these important societal ills. In the graphic here, we can see the relationship between technology diversity and national diversity. And relatedly, here's the 2019 Google Diversity Report. This report talks about who they're hiring. 75% of the people hired in the 2019 report were men, and almost 52% were Asian, and 43.5% were white. Just like with the Harvard admissions and just like who's scoring well on the SAT, we're seeing that the people being hired in these lucrative technology jobs that are really having a tremendous impact on society are the same people. Here's a broader look at the racial and ethnic divides in Silicon Valley. And this is data reported by the Stanford Center for Education Policy Analysis in 2017. And it's looked at the trends in racial and ethnic hiring as it relates to people who are programmers. And you can see along the bottom, it starts with 1980, 1990, the year 2000, 2010, and 2015. And we can see that whites and Asians are, are taking up the majority of the programming positions. Although every five years we're seeing a huge jump in the number of programming jobs, the percent of Hispanics and African Americans in those jobs is not really reflected in who's being hired in Silicon Valley. And why does this matter? Well, we know that technologies, and in, in general, and in particular those being built by Silicon Valley, come with inherent biases. And those biases come from the people who are designing and developing and implementing those tools. Now, this brings me to a famous book by Douglas Rushkoff that came out in 2010 called Program or Be Programmed. And he argues that when human beings acquired language, we learned not just how to listen, but how to speak. When we gained literacy, we learned not just how to read, but how to write. And as we move into an increasingly digital reality, we must learn not just how to use programs, but how to make them. In the emerging highly programmed landscape ahead, you will either create the software or you will be the software. It's really that simple. Program 
or be programmed. Essentially, Rushkoff is arguing that society is becoming increasingly dependent on digital machines, yet only a small number of people know how they work or how to make them. And that is contributing to the existing inequalities that we are experiencing. So the question is, what are we to do? As educators, how should we go about making ethical decisions about technology in situations where different and conflicting interests are at stake? What we need is a framework for ethical analysis, something to help us identify issues and focus debates, something that would be a good vehicle for education and discussion, something to help us tease out the issues and people's feelings, and something that ultimately might aid the decision-making process. In other words, what we need is a framework for ethical analysis, something that considers different stakeholder groups and is guided by different predetermined principles. And that's exactly where we're heading in the weeks ahead. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.